You are listening to Over and Back's Basketball Mysteries of the 1970s. Today's mystery is, who launched the three-pointer? All right, so we are back on our uh, Basketball Mysteries of the 70s series. I am Jason, with me as usual is Rich, and we are going to discuss... uh, who launched the three-pointer? Of course, the the ABA um, famously began in 1967 and 1968 season, and uh, it was the not the first league to have the three-pointer because actually the American Basketball League of the early 60s had a three-pointer, but it took that idea and uh, and put it into the ABA and helped uh, launch a revolutionary a revolution that uh, that later would of course change the the entire dynamic of how the game was played in it ruin you meant you meant to say ruin the basketball in this year uh, it actually this past year ruined uh, the game of basketball it did it, so it, it's uh, a, unfortunately yeah yes. uh basketball is no longer <laughs> it is all done because you know guys shoot three to runners now uh but it's it's a shame yeah and you know you would have hoped they would have gotten record ratings you know revenues would be up but they're not basketball's ruined it's over basketball is totally ruined yeah it, it's unfortunate <laughs> but it's that's our next mystery of the yes. 1970s. Yeah, how did basketball <laughs> get ruined thanks to three <laughs> right uh, so i mean you know the um and the three-pointer was actually it's it sort of you know of course when it first comes out you're not exactly sure what to make of the three pointer, like how to use it, what the strategy is, um, you know, how often to shoot it, how little to shoot it. I mean, th- there was definitely understanding of what it could provide in terms of spacing, in terms of o- opening up the floor, in terms of you had to, you know, you if you had the right guy shooting it, you had to guard the, um, you had to guard the perimeter. So, so there was definitely the appreciation of that. But you know, there were teams that shot it quite a bit, uh, you know, especially for the time, and in, into really ratios that would not be seen until maybe the mid '90s. And then there were teams that almost completely you know uh did not use it hardly at all it, at the same level in which you know teams in the early 80s in the nba when it was adopted there would use it you know famously like the i think the 82 or 83 lakers and the 82 lakers shot like 22 three pointers the entire season you know something like that <laughs> so um so it's interesting to kind of look at how you know what acceptance you know who were the pioneers of the three-pointer and you know so on and so forth yeah, I think one of the things that we we sort of take for granted is, you know, I grew up in an era where the three pointer was just kind of always there. Anytime I played basketball, whether it be in, you know, you know, in park district basketball or in high school or with my friends, I always had the three pointer. I always had that. I'm sure for the most part, you, you you did as well. I mean, that's most people listening to this probably grew up in the three pointer, which is kind of always there. But you have to remember, and, and that's one of my favorite parts of loose balls is when they talk about they have a whole chapter pretty much devoted to the three-pointer and the big thing that a lot of guys say is that like we were hardwired and it wasn't you know we had learned basketball our entire lives and that thing wasn't there it was different like it wasn't you know it, we just we, we didn't know what to do with it like there's um you know one story it's november 13th 1967 uh, which is of course the first year of the aba and the first year of the three-pointer uh in the league of course uh it's the pacers versus the dallas chaparrells uh there's one second left on the clock 118 116 jerry harkless uh, he's about 92 feet away from the basket uh he throws kind of just a towering pass throws it you know whatever hail mary pass it goes in it smacks off the backboard goes in pandemonium goes you know the the crowd's going nuts the announcers are going nuts and the guys they kind of get ready for a huddle they're like all right cool (laughs) we gotta you know in 118 118 we're going to ot we're going to ot and apparently a ref had to come up and tell the guys like no you're done like you won and and you know they didn't know like they were ready for the huddle like it's like we've always just had the two-pointer you know it, it, it was you know, he, he recalls, you know, 68 feet behind the brand new three point line. But still, they it just it, it, they weren't wired to do that. It was a two point shot. Every shot's two point. You know, and, and it's like we sort of take that for granted that there was a time where these guys are just wired into it. There's also a quote, uh, Hubie Brown. I uh, had a really good quote in Loose Balls talking about it, uh, just that we kind of had to rethink everything we knew about the game. Here's a quote. Uh, you have to tell your players to remember who the shooters are and when those guys are 25 feet from the basket. Get in their jocks and guard them. Don't give them 25-footer, which is something players have been conditioned to do all their lives. And as a coach, if you have a shooter with range, you have to give him all the freedom to take the 25-footer, which is a philosophy that goes against what you've learned as a young coach, namely pound the ball inside. Yeah. So we're looking at a whole different like dynamic of the game. Like, as you said, they knew what it was power, you know, what it was capable of, but like we're talking about how hard wiring here where these guys have just played forever with these certain, you know, idioms and certain ways to play the game. 
and all of a sudden it's gone. And it, it, it's kind of, I mean, it, we sort of, I think as younger fans and, and, you know, not being there, take it for granted of how different and how changing that was just one little thing to change the game completely, you know, altered how it was. Yeah. And it's worth noting that the, um, the three pointer in the ABA actually was the same distance. It was 23, you know, feet, nine inches that it is mm-hmm. today in the NBA, it, but it was commonly referred to as a 25 footer. I, I think in the, um, in the American basketball league in the early sixties, it actually was 25. And so, so that, that was something that was confusing to me, but so just to clarify, it is referred to as a 25 footer also known as, <laughs> as the home run, but it is actually was the same length as, it is today so Absolutely. it's also 22 feet um, at the corners at, at the same dimensions exactly that they are today <laughs> it, it, in the aba it was, it was the same dimension so yeah but like you had mentioned there was this weird like fluctuation of, of of how did teams react to this thing how do we what do we do how do we do this you know and like you said some teams were like all right cool this is awesome we're gonna take a lot of these and some didn't you know take any of them so there's um the teams averaged uh, 390 attempts uh, in that inaugural season in the ABA, they shot uh, 28.5%, which is, of course, not great. But given that, like, that's a whole new dynamic of the game and guys didn't really shoot from that distance or probably practice it all that much, I, I'd say it's pretty good. Uh, of course, some liked it a lot more uh, than others. Pittsburgh, uh, they led the league with 790 attempts, which uh, in a second, you'll see why that's uh, significant. Uh, and they had an average of 30.8, so uh, probably a good shot for them. Uh, Dallas, the Chaparrales, they were dead last with 120. So you look at the fluctuations right there, 790 to 120, which is just uh, incredible. Uh, Lester Selvage, Anaheim, he led the league with 461 three-point attempts on his own. Um, he shot, to be fair, a respectable 31.9% uh, from there. But, yeah, it was a, a, a high number for this guy, and he uh, was not around uh, anymore after this. This was his last year. Yeah. So not playing professional basketball, which I'm sure. But uh, I don't know. I guess he was given the green light. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, it's interesting because obviously like that wouldn't I mean, the percentage is too low. But I mean, if it were relative, I mean, that 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 was, you know, I think in the top 10 in the league or so. Um, so, you know, compare it. That would be something we would he would be encouraged to do today. I mean, assuming the percentage bumped up, you know, as it is, you know, um, in proportion to what it is in the league today. So sure. uh, obviously that maybe his other dimensions were so bad that he couldn't have stayed there anyway. But, um, but, but, but obviously just funny how the philosophy has changed. Yeah, and there, there's a quote um, it's from Loose Balls as well that uh, he acted like if he stepped over the three-point line, he was going to get killed or something. He didn't just shoot 25-footers. He took 30-footers. All he could do was shoot, and he shot too much. But when he was hot, he was unlike anything I'd ever seen, and that was uh, his co- uh, or Denver's coach, uh, Bob Bass, Denver Rockets. Yes. Coach Bob Bass. I, so. I, think, I feel like similar things have been said by, about Steph Curry, although, you know, obviously he makes so many of those shots that people don't really say that. Anymore, right, but, right, right. But the whole idea of, like, he's ruining the game because he's taking all these three-pointers, you know. It's, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Basketball mysteries of the 1970s. Uh, did Lester Selvage ruin basketball? <laughs> there you the go. Yes. Maybe. We have solved that. We have detectives and we have solved it. All right. He destroyed it. But uh, yeah, you, it, the yearly averages and the amount of shots taken, uh, the amount of three-point shots taken, there's some weird fluctuations here. Um, the first, uh, well, actually, we'll jump ahead to 1969 here. Uh, 460 attempts, 29.9%. Uh, the year after that, 1970, of course, 531, 29.1. So we stay pretty normal. Uh, 71, 516, 29.9% again. So we're, we're staying there. Then we see 19. 72 we see 40 uh 442 attempts so we see a, a pretty big drop there 1973 very interestingly enough 316 attempts so it drops almost well over 100 uh, attempts uh 28.9 percent so guys uh, shoot a little bit less as well uh 1974 351 1975 311 and then 1976 266 so we see a high point in 1970 and then a slow decline and then just a massive decline uh between 1972 and 1993 or, uh, 1972 and 1973 rather um any theory as to why this happened yeah i that's hard i mean maybe the big men got a bit better as the league went on so it may have just been a you know the the offense is running through more of the big men um you know um as you know the, the forwards were strong well, the forwards were strong initially in the league anyway but it wasn't you know like julie serving wasn't this you know great um three-point shooter and like you know or like roger brown was a pretty good shooter you know to start off with so you know and, and rick berry was an okay outside shooter so yeah yeah maybe guys were just getting more to the basket and trying to get up closer i mean maybe just the novelty kind of wore off and people just you know didn't think it was it was effective to um to do it even though you know the 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 team that did the first year so much did win the championship 
Yeah, I think one of my maybe my little theory, and I have no idea, and I can't really back that up with any proof right now. But it would be interesting to kind of go to is I wonder if the the growing sort of respectability of the league and the amount of people that were coming into the league in terms of guys that were veteran coaches, guys that had come from the NBA, better players, but you know those first few years, it's kind of a ragtag bunch of guys in there, and they probably you know. But as you start to see, and, and you can see it in some coaching changes, especially you know in those you know the early seventies, you started getting a lot of influx of former NBA coaches, former NBA players, guys, you know former NBA executives like it it when it starts to become I think in, in a little ways and of course it's still the ABA but I wonder if it you know you start to get a little bit of this league becoming closer to the NBA and becoming closer to being you know a true second professional league if that's sort of those influx where you get those guys and these new coaches going oh, no, we ain't taking those threes those are stupid get down there I, I, I don't know I have no idea if that's exactly what it is it just seems to kind of coincide with the league gaining in a little bit of popularity at that same time yeah that that that's a good theory i honestly yeah i don't really have a good explanation for it. it's not really addressed in you know th- this whole um dip in, th- in three pointers honestly wasn't even mentioned in loose balls it was something we kind of looked at when we not at all. were looking at numbers so um I, yeah that, that that's a hard one i i don't really know um what the answer is but i think your theory is as good as any yeah, and uh, Louis Dampier, he's an interesting one to, to check out these fluctuations as well. Uh, he was Kentucky's famed uh, outside shooter. Uh, he, you know, in 19, in, in, in the, the, in 67, 68, he shoots 142. So whatever, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I don't really want to do it. Then he says, okay, I, I kind of like this. 552 in, in 68, 69, uh, 548 in 69, 70. And then by 70, 71, he goes back to 280, and he would never reach over 250 again. Yeah. So he has like two years where he just, just like goes insane and just goes nuts, and then right back to his normal. It, it's just, it's very strange, these fluctuations. Yeah, and for those who don't know, Louis Dapier is, you know, one of the best guards in ABA history. He, pl- yeah. he pl- played basically the entire uh, league, all for the Colonels, and was, you know, a, a tremendous player. And the three pointer really made turn him from like a good player to a really special player. I mean, that was really he was one of the first guys to have like you know longevity in his career, but you know based on his skill from that three point. I mean, he was he was a point guard, but he was a little bit like Reggie Miller in that sense, where you know he was kind of the 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 first guy to <clears throat> be a star in the league and use that as a consistent weapon for a long period of time. Absolutely. And uh, his career, uh, ABA career, he shot 35.8%. So really good. Uh, Daryl Carrier, he's the top. Uh, he shot 37.7, which uh, in 1,055 attempts. Yeah. So not not a, not that, not that, you know, not, not a low amount of attempts. It's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Combs, uh, 36.7. That's in about a little over 1,300 attempts. And then George Lehman, uh, 36.5 in about uh, 1,100 attempts. Yeah. So uh, it, some guys that were really good at it. Yeah, it's, it's worth mentioning Dampier and Carrier were in the same backcourt for a few years. And- yeah. Yes, yeah, so they, the, the it worked days. for. Them. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, although the Colonels were not a particularly good team at first, but um, but yes, they certainly got pretty good production from their backcourt. Absolutely, uh, and I guess another question in, in this mystery, as we sort of figure out about it, is should teams have used it a little bit more? And again, I looked at it, and I don't know if it's chicken and egg. I don't know what is what, but a lot of successful teams took a lot of threes, and I don't know if that is you know causal, correlative. I don't know, but twenty four ABA teams. Uh, took at least 500 threes in a season. Uh, six of those won 50 plus games, and 14 were above uh, uh, 500. So, including a lot of champions too, which we'll talk about here in a little bit in terms of the biggest success stories. So, there are a lot of teams that were able to utilize it a lot, you know, real well. And it's not, you know, again, I don't know if shooting three pointers was successful for them or if they were just good at three pointers and that's why they were successful. But it, it, it's an interesting theory nonetheless. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would imagine that it, you know, it certainly had to be helpful. I mean, obviously, it's worth one more, right? <laughs> and if you can make them, yeah, I, I mean, I, obviously, yes, with the caveat that you have to have guys who, um, who can make them. But I mean, the smart teams realized pretty quickly that, you know, that, that it could be used as a weapon, and and obviously had a lot of success with you know having guards who shot three pointers. Um, you know, as you mentioned here, the, yeah, the uh, the the first um, you, you've uh, four of the first five uh, ABA champions, um, all you know you had above average uh, three point uh, totals and you know were among the tops in the league of uh, shooting three pointers so that you know that's just something right there yeah you know the pyre uh, the pipers of course the inaugural nba champ uh, aba champions uh, 790 uh, three pointers they won 54 games uh, 6 9 70 and 70 71 indiana pacers they won 59 and 58 games uh, and got a title in 70 and then uh, the utah stars as well uh, the, the following year, they shot uh, 676 en route to the uh, championship and a 57-win season. So there you go. I mean, there's success right in that 
aspect, but there's some failures as well. The 1971-72 uh, Memphis Pros, they shot 652 threes, and they won 26 games. They won 26 and 58. And then the 67-68 Anaheim Amigos with, of course, our, our, our friend Lester over there, uh, they shot 716 threes, and they went uh, 25 and 53. Yes. So and, and, and it, not always good. Yeah, but. and it's worth noting the Pipers had uh, Connie Hawkins, uh, who we're going to talk about a bit more of the Pipers in a future show. Uh, the Utah Stars um, had Zemo Beatty, and the mm-hmm. Pacers had... Uh, um, and the Pacers had Mel Daniels. So all their best players were not guys who shot three-pointers. But no. <laughs> um, but obviously, you know, uh, I'm sure the, having the three-pointer as a threat was an element to, um, to, to their success. One of my favorite parts of our Basketball Mysteries of the 1970s series is our awesome logo. It does a perfect job encapsulating exactly the tone and feel we wanted with the series. Well, today, I have some exciting news for you. The illustrator of that fantastic logo, Daniel J. Rowell, has made the logo, the cream and Dr. J. Head, as well as a bunch of other of his art, available to purchase at DanielJRowell.com. Simply go to DanielJRowell.com, that's D-A-N-I-E-L-J-R-O-W-E-L-L.com, click on merch, and you can buy sweaters, coffee mugs, shirts, and more featuring Daniel's art. Now, just in case you're still on the fence, do know that Daniel can hold a piece of toast in his mouth for a solid uh, 45 seconds or so without dropping it. Plus, if you need a little bit more convincing, his aunt has described these shirts as fabulous. Again, to buy your tea, mug, or anything else that your little heart desires, go to Daniel J. Rowell, that's D-A-N-I-E-L-J-R-O-W-E-L-L.com, and click on Merch. You were going to talk about how the uh, NBA adopted the three-point rule. I was going to say, yes, yeah, so we were getting a little bit out of the 80s, or out of the 70s, rather, and into the 80s. But, uh, yes, the three-pointer uh, made its way to the NBA in 1979, uh, 80s season. The NBA adopted the three-point line. Uh, most people viewed it as a gimmick, which it may be, but um, it, it, of course, held on and, of course, ruined basketball, uh, as we mentioned before. But uh, Chris Ford has the distinction of the Boston Celtics uh, making the first three-point shot in NBA history on October 12, 1979. And then Kevin Grevy of the Washington Bullets uh, also made one on that same day. So two guys made it same day. Chris Ford, though, uh, gets the nod as the first uh, three-pointer, a uh, recorded three-pointer in NBA history. And then uh, the NBA had it, and they were off and running. Yeah, a- a- indeed. So... Um all right. Well, thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, checking us out. You can find us at harborproxism.com. You can find us on uh, iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, please leave a rating and review for able to do so. It helps people uh, figure out uh, what we're doing. Um, go to harborproxism.com. That is our uh, home, and there's some great uh, basketball writing and podcasts uh, there as well. And um, – if you're enjoying uh, the uh, Basketball Mysteries uh, of the 1970s uh, series, uh, please let us know. We're going to be continuing it throughout the uh, summer, and we hope people like it. We're uh, excited to do it. So until next time, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again soon. Next time on Basketball Mysteries of the 1970s. It was five on seven in that fourth quarter. It was an astonishing trans- uh, travesty of justice against the Celtics, most exemplified in one particular play.